Good morning, everyone. Uh, before we start the formal presentation, I did want to give a couple of updates uh, on two items I think of, of, are of importance and likely to be in, in the question period. The first one is we do not have any updated guidance on the uh, distribution of Johnson & Johnson doses to us um, as, as local health departments departments coming from the feds to the state to the local health departments. Uh, when we do find that out, we will let you all know. Um, in addition to that, there have not been any uh, changes to the, the guidelines uh, provided from the state in terms of how those doses should be used. So as it currently stands, we will continue to, uh, we will restart, I continue, we will restart using the Johnson & Johnson doses uh, once they are provided. We did have a supply of doses uh, remaining when there was a pause that we're continuing to use, particularly with our homebound uh, population, given the ease of getting one shot versus two shots from a logistical perspective. Uh, and again, as I said, we do not have any updated allocations in terms of uh, what doses we will receive from the state and how those doses will be distributed and doled out. The second component it relates to mass guidance. Uh, there is conversation and chatter that there will be an announcement by the Biden administration and the CDC today in terms of providing new face covering guidelines, uh, particularly for those who are vaccinated uh, in, uh, and, and new policies related to outdoor usage. We do not have any updates on that so far. That has not been announced. Uh, and from the public health perspective, the guidance that we would provide would continue to be consistent with the CDC and any further guidance that the state would provide. So those are two important announcements, again, that I anticipate questions may be coming about those two particular things, but just wanted to uh, preempt that and give you the updates that we have so far. Uh, let me attempt to share my screen. Uh, it's not working. One second. Why is it not working? All right, let's see if this works. All right, so I wanted to provide an update in terms of where we stand with our uh, vaccine numbers and community transmission levels. Uh, in terms of community transmission, our test positivity rate continues to be, uh, I think it was 20 fourth yesterday out of the state. Uh, and our case rate is, I believe, 21st out of 24 jurisdictions. Uh, and our cases have dropped now averaging under 100 cases on a daily basis. Our hospitalization numbers are holding steady. And um, as of yesterday, we had uh, reached the mark of 50.4% of our residents having received at least one dose of the vaccine. Now, just to, again, get further a uh, picture of where we stand in terms of our transmission risk, uh, our transmission rate has, uh, has dropped to 8.3 cases per 100,000 residents. Uh, it had been over the 10 per 100,000 resident threshold uh, for the last several weeks. It has dropped and hopefully will continue to move downward in that direction. And that's consistent with CDC definition of moderate risk of transmission. Uh, in terms of looking at our doses uh, of our percentage of our residents vaccinated, again, yesterday we crossed the 50% uh, threshold or milestone of our 50% of our residents receiving at least one dose. And we currently stand at 34% of our residents being vaccinated. And when you look at that, again, in comparison to other jurisdictions, we are just behind Howard and Talbot County. Uh, and when looking at our percentages of our older populations, we've uh, received, we've crossed 70 percent of those 65 and up uh, who've been fully vaccinated. Uh, next slide here just shows the number of vaccines that we have administered uh, throughout the, the vaccine response so far. Uh, and this breaks down the site uh, of where uh, folks have received that. And as you can see, the percentage, the two places where the majority of our residents are receiving vaccines are the county operation apparatus and the mass vac sites, uh, not only the one here in Germantown, but across the state. 
Uh, this breaks down the age distribution, again, in terms of uh, the percentage, excuse me, of folks who are coming in and getting vaccinated. We are hopeful that the percentage of younger people will continue to increase as some jurisdictions have experienced some hesitancy in younger populations. Uh, and we think that could be what is driving uh, the phenomenon in a few jurisdictions where the, the, the supply of vaccine is out performing the demand of the vaccine. And so it underscores uh, the importance of providing further education and outreach to those respective communities to ensure that they're getting vaccine coverage. And as you know, some states have taken some different actions. Uh, yesterday, the governor of West Virginia announced that the state would be providing $100 savings bonds to those uh, between 16 and 35, I believe, to encourage them to get vaccinated. Uh, this breaks down our race, uh, vaccine rates by racial and ethnic categories. Again, we have seen a significant drop in the percentage difference, the gap between white residents and black residents and Latino residents um, over time. Uh, and we're hopeful that particularly as it has been opened up to uh, across age categories that we'll see those gaps close even more, but also underscores the need to continue to uh, provide some focused uh, interventions uh, and outreach to those areas that have been hit hardest by geography and racial and ethnic categories. This shows you the geographic breakdown once again in terms of uh, the percentage of folks who received at least one dose over the uh, 65 and up. And if you think back to the graph three slides, three or four slides ago, uh, the percentage of 65 and up who have received at least one dose is well over 80%. Uh, and this just underscores that we have a ways to go with those under 65, given that it is now open across all different age categories. Uh, and this this is just another geographic representation of the percentage of folks who received at least one dose with an overlaying component to show the percentage of those who, uh, a higher percentage of those who've been fully vaccinated. Uh, we don't currently have, again, we are at 36%, 34% of our residents who've been fully vaccinated. So we do have a ways to go before we reach the 50% threshold, which was included as a part of the reopening metrics that will be debated, uh, or at least have, have been introduced and will be discussed later. Uh, Pre-registration statistics, we still have roughly over 100,000 folks who are in our pre-registration queue who uh, are awaiting that vaccine appointments. Uh, and again, it's not clear. We'd have to clean the data further to tease out how many of those may have received vaccines in other sites. Uh, but unlike uh, a lot of the other jurisdictions right now, we still have a higher demand than the supply that we have available. Uh, and so we're going to continue to work as best as we can through an appointment system, but we are working on contingency plans behind the scenes to be able to stand up walk up options in the future. Uh, we continue to use our equity framework. And again, that is going to take on even more importance as we have um, opened up or all folks across the age categories are eligible for the vaccine. Again, there hasn't been significant change in terms of those tier one zip codes based upon the equity criteria and the impact of COVID in terms of transmission levels, uh, related morbidity, uh, COVID related morbidity, um, as well as number of new cases. That concludes the presentation part. Um, happy to answer any questions. I would throw out two other things just as I thought through in the presentation. Uh, of note also, uh, we are hopeful that there will be a hearing uh, by FDA to consider uh, dropping the age, the lower age limit for at least one of the vaccines. Uh, Pfizer has requested an EUA hearing to permit the use of their vaccine in uh, pediatric populations between 12 and 15. They continue to do trials in terms of the efficacy and safety of using the vaccine in younger populations. Uh, don't believe there has been a date uh, assigned to that. We speculate that that may have been temporarily postponed due to working through the issues with the Johnson & Johnson dose uh, from the last several weeks. Uh, and the other one that I wanted to highlight is one, one area that we talk a lot about is our homebound population. We had over 1,300 who had been pre-registered. We vaccinated uh, over 631. 
96 folks have canceled the registration appointments and we have a remaining uh, number in that queue of 627. 165 of those are covered as part of the aging and disability initiative working through independent living facilities, which would leave approximately 462 other individuals who have pre-registered um, saying that they are homebound that we're continuing to work through and chip away uh, in terms of providing vaccines to that group. Uh, I will stop there, turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Stoddard. Happy to answer any questions you all may have. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I have just a few additional points to provide to uh, highlight a few things Dr. Gales provided and add a couple of things to it. Uh, first off, the state approached us about an additional mobile vaccination opportunity in our, uh, their words, not mine, hard to reach communities. Uh, and so we actually were approached and they're interested in coming tomorrow through Sunday. So we were approached yesterday about this. We immediately said yes. We're working with them uh, to work out the logistics of those. And we've reached out to the minority health initiatives to help ha have them help us identify appropriate locations. What we've reached out to all of the minority health initiatives. And so the the it's a mobile opportunity. We're likely to pick uh, several different locations where vaccine will be offered over the next five days. That will not be in lieu of, but in addition to the opportunity they had previously approached us about coming from May 11th to May 17th. And so we will have multiple FEMA, FEMA, MEMA coordinated vaccine opportunities coming to Montgomery County uh, starting tomorrow, continuing through, Friday, through Sunday, and then an additional trip back at least in May. And we've essentially told them anytime they have openings in their schedule, we're more than happy to find places to host uh, FEMA sponsored mobile clinics. They're, they come with the 500 doses, and so the 500 doses are being transferred to us today. Uh, the vaccinators and pre registration is all handled by the FEMA team. Uh, we just have to find locations, provide tables and chairs, and have an on-site liaison to help support those efforts. And we're doing all of those things. Uh, Dr. Yellow, I talked about the Johnson Johnson. We have approximately 1,300 doses remaining at the mass vaccination site from previous, prior to the pause. Uh, the seat, uh, a mass vaccination coordinator did reach out and ask if, if uh, they didn't have numbers yet, but they asked if we were willing to do additional Johnson Johnson doses at the Germantown site. And we, of course, said yes. So we're hoping that will be part of our allocation this week. Um, I know you all are getting briefed by Director Riley on the senior center issue. They are working towards uh, opening up senior centers by, you know, by the end of next month is, is, is the goal. They've got two that they've identified. Obviously, one, one of our senior centers is being utilized as, uh, as, a, as an extension of our homeless sheltering program right now and two are being utilized for vaccination clinics. So we're working through the, through the challenges of that. I don't want to say whether or how those will work out, but they are, they are planning to open senior centers. And I also know that the library's issue is one that we're supposed to hear about, but I don't have an initial update this morning. I reached out to uh, Director uh, Silo and, and uh, have not heard back on an update there. I know that they were still working through some of the details and getting those sites back up and getting their staff back in to do them. So as soon as I have that update, I'll write it. Now, on the specific numbers of pre-registration, I actually got an update this morning, so I'll share that. So there are approximately 111,000 people still in the system. Uh, 77,375 have received a notification, at least one, which leaves a remainder of, of 33,767 who have still not received a first notification for vaccine opportunity. So just about, uh, you know, uh, we met about, a, let's say, 20% off of what we were at last week. And so... That gives you a sense of the pacing. We uh, we at, or at, I think on Sunday was the last day we tracked how many people we added. We only added about 300 people to the list. So the rate of people pre-registering is slowing. The rate of people being offered opportunities is staying holding steady. So we are we are um, working our way through that list. And obviously over the next I think, several weeks we'll complete that list very likely. And uh, that's when we'll certainly have to start to consider some of the things we talked about, which are sort of on-demand appointment selection or walk-ups or, or some other opportunities. And as Dr. Yellow alluded, we are continuing to evolve the vaccine dissemination program to focus more into communities. This FEMA effort is a part of that. Uh, the state has also talked about there's a mobile uh, trailer opportunity that we're working with them to identify uh, uh, to arrange for Montgomery County as well. And so uh, the, the portfolio of vaccination opportunities continues to increase and we're going to continue to support that uh, in partnership with the state and federal government. So that's all I have. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> let me turn it to my colleagues, but uh, Dr. Gale, since you brought up the homebound residents, um, 
I'll just say I've been in touch with uh, about half a dozen caretakers for very elderly individuals, most of them in their 90s, who pre-registered and they're very anxious because they haven't received a timeline or updates from the county um, is, is what they're telling us. One family in my neighborhood gave up and took three individuals to carry and load their mother in and out of a car to get a vaccine. Um, it's great to hear the update. Uh, are we able to send out an, uh, an email update to those individuals so they at least know where they stand? And will they receive the J&J &J vaccine now that that's available again? Uh, Dr. Bridges is on and can comment further about the specific logistics, but one of the, the issues as we've discussed previously mm -hmm. uh, with it is we have worked to support community clinics to do homebound testing, and we had hoped to be able to leverage our, contact, our contract with one of the agencies who had been working with us to provide testing to homebound folks um, that unfortunately was not able to move forward due to some logistical concerns related to observation of the vaccine distribution. Dr. Bridges, did you have any other? Sure. Good, good morning, Council President Hucker and all. Um, the team began contacting all the individuals that Dr. Gale referenced um, uh, earlier in his uh, update uh, to the Board of Health. Um, they started uh, contacting them via email last night, not only to determine if they still, in fact, um, are requesting a um, vaccine, but to identify any individuals who live in their house because the goal is to not only to vaccinate the resident or homebound resident, but individuals who are in their house as well. So we prepared information to follow up um, beginning last night. We've also added additional uh, clinical staff so that we can aggressively move through the remaining individuals who are homebound to get them vaccinated as quickly as possible. So those clinical, um, those uh, nurses, clinical staff um, that we receive report from our agency, uh, Aging and Disability Services Branch will be trained this week, uh, beginning today for vaccination protocols so that we can deploy them similar to the strike teams that we deployed early on in the testing effort where we sent those individuals to nursing homes and assisted living facilities. The team is also identifying those individual spaces that may have already been vaccinated and they're going through and, and um, uh, checking the list to make sure that there are no additional individuals that may have been vaccinated either through our senior independent living um, effort, uh, through assisted living facilities and support of the state or any nursing homes. So that's pretty much the status operationally and logistically for our homebound vaccination um, plan. That's helpful, thanks. I'm glad an email will go out. Are we able to make a phone call to those individuals too? Because I think a lot of them might not see the email. Yes, yes, uh, Council President Harper. We will also follow up with emails, particularly those individual emails that may bounce back, or if we don't hear a response within the next 48 hours, we're gonna contact them via um, our pre-registration uh, support line 240-777-2982, again, 240-777. 777-2982. And any listeners who are viewing um, the council sitting as a board of health, if you have pre-registered and you have not received an email uh, by tomorrow, please contact that number. Our call staff are available and we'll follow up to ensure that you receive a vaccination. You anticipated my next question. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for that answer. Council Member Rice. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so Dr. Gales, um, let me start off with something that we discussed uh, at the end of last week, which is uh, about vaccinations. We continue to hear, and even last night in Up County Citizens Advisory Board meeting, um, we heard from residents there who were on the list to receive vaccinations and still obviously had not uh, received an appointment. Can we can we understand an approximation based on, I know this is difficult, but based on where we are uh, in terms of the list, how many people are still there, how many vaccinations we're still getting, have we run an estimation of how much longer it'll take us to get through that list in terms of an approximation of dates so that people have a fair expectation of when they may start to receive notifications about their eligibility to receive a vaccine? 
Thank you, Councilman Moraes, for the question. Um, your question highlights, again, the challenge that we have uh, in our jurisdiction of where the supply doesn't meet the demand. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Stoddard can correct me if I'm wrong with the pre-registration information. We still have over 100,000 folks on that list. And in the last month or so, or the last three weeks in particular, we've had, we went from 10,000 doses a week that we were getting as a health department, as well as the promise of over 3,000 doses a day at the mass back site. And all of that has been cut. So in terms of math, we went from, for the health department, 10,720 doses to 7,020 doses on a weekly basis. And then for the mass vac site, if you, you put it out for, uh, seven days a week, 3,000 doses a day, that's approximately somewhere between, that's 21,000 doses, when in fact that number has been 4,800 doses for the last several weeks, for the entire week. And so the challenge for us is, is when you look at that, that's, if you put the two of those together alone, that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 12,000 doses a week at our current pace. And we still, you know, again, have approximately 100,000 folks on our pre-registration list. We are hopeful and still have the infrastructure in place to be able to absorb more doses. Uh, in particular, you know, the mass vac site was built to accommodate 3,000 doses a day. And the county infrastructure, in addition to be able to stand up the county sites that we have, we have been banking on getting more doses to be able to provide to our community partners as an additional extension uh, into communities to provide other sites as well. So the challenge is, and again, a lot of this was informed by the manufacturing issues with Johnson & Johnson, as well as the last two weeks in terms of that, those doses being paused. Um, there's speculation that there's somewhere between 10, mil, 10 to 11 million Johnson & Johnson doses waiting to be distributed um, to states across the country to then be distributed to health departments. Uh, and we're hopeful that when that supply increases, that also will take some of the pressure off of the use of the, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which have been used to make up for the, the shortfall in the Johnson & Johnson doses over the last three weeks. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a timeline per se, because that would be dependent upon when we get more information information about the doses, but just wanted to level set expectation in terms of the numbers where they stand right now. We're hopeful that will change soon and we will be able to get doses out to those folks um, on the pre-registration list. Uh, and in the meantime, I would encourage folks to not only look at our county sites, but if there are opportunities to get vaccinated through the retail pharmacies or the mass vac sites in other parts of the state, I would encourage folks to continue to uh, look into those resources. Sources. Now, uh, 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 yeah, Stoddard, gonna, go ahead. I was just going to give some actual numbers to this. So I looked at, I'm looking at the pre-registration data from two weeks ago yesterday. There were 142,500. There were approximately 111,000 people to, uh, as of yesterday. So two weeks, we, we went through about 31,000 people on the list. And, and recognizing that that's not 31,000 people that's been exclusively vaccinated by Montgomery County. That's 31,000 people who we were able to remove via the state list. So that's all sources. And so that tells you just approximation that maybe three, three and a half weeks, we should be able to go through the rest of this list for sure, uh, just based on the people who are going to come, come through our opportunities or opportunities around the state. And so I think that gives you a rough estimate of, you know, for the people who are currently on the list, that's really what we're talking about is maybe three, three and a half weeks. Sure. So we're looking at May, June, and then, um, and that's the folks that are on our pre-registration list. And then we need to tackle some of the folks uh, who we haven't hit yet, who may be hesitant to get on the list for whatever reasons, all right? And those can be a myriad of things. I still see our numbers in our communities of color that are woefully short of uh, their white counterparts and just wanted to reiterate that for us. And that's the reason why when it comes to our public vaccination sites that we need to continue to make sure that those are stood up. Uh, and because we have strategies associated, um, when it comes to the other sites, uh, it's really uh, first come first serve, who you know, getting the connections, getting vaccine hunters to work for you. Uh, I've seen it, uh, so it does work. Uh, and so I would encourage folks who do uh, and feel really urgent uh, and pressing need about getting an appointment to make sure that they reach out and utilize those services. But I did want to talk about one thing, Dr. Yales, that you mentioned that I think is incredibly important for 
our communities, and especially for the folks who I understand, and I talked about this before last week, our shift workers, our folks who can't, uh, you know, afford the time to get uh, multiple vaccinations, because that means multiple times off of work, sometimes travel, even though it's in Germantown now in Montgomery County for a mass vac site, the reality is, is that that's still far for a lot of people in our community. And so from that perspective, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, certainly represents uh, a much more convenient uh, opportunity for folks. And I will just say this, on March 8th, uh, at the Regency site, I was administered the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I am perfectly fine. I have not had any health uh, concerns or issues. And so I wanna make sure that my community understands that you have a person who's taken it uh, and who is fine. I promise you that I would not advocate for this if I did not feel it was safe and I would advocate it for any member of my family. So I encourage you to please take whatever vaccine is available to you. It is important for us to try and achieve that herd immunity by making sure that as many people as possible avail themselves of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And so Dr. Gales, what is your message uh, to our community when it comes to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and how important it is for folks to be able to take whichever one is available? Um, because I'm concerned the latest statistics last night in a Washington Post poll uh, said that only 27% of Americans feel comfortable in terms of you know taking the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, what do you tell those uh, you know seventy three percent who are hesitant or fearful of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine? I would actually take the recording of what you just said and play that uh, because that's that that speaks for itself. Um, and you, along with nearly eight million other folks have had the same experience. They've taken the vaccine. They've not had the complications that were reported. Uh, and again, it's important to emphasize that there has not been a causal link established to link the vaccine with the episodes of, of the clots in terms of saying folks got this because uh, they got the clots because of the vaccine. Um, and so it's important to, to look at it from that perspective. Now, certainly we acknowledge the concerns and that is why the due diligence was done to look at the different cases. Uh, but you, again, you along with nearly 8 million other folks did not have any of those complications compared to 15 uh, reported cases of uh, the blood clots. Now, what's also interesting is, is that it created the opportunity to study those cases to find out if that happens, again, extremely, extremely rare. It provided guidance to providers in order to treat that um, those episodes in a safe manner to minimize any potential long-term risk or side effects. Um, so again, I not not selling a broken record, but your testimony is exactly what I would promote and what I would say to encourage folks to to get the vaccine. Um, all three vaccines again have been. And, uh, nearly 100% effective in terms of preventing COVID-related hospitalizations, as well as 100% effective in terms of preventing COVID-related fatalities. Well, thank you for that. And so certainly, um, as the CDC said, the uh, benefits far outweigh uh, any kind of risk uh, that's associated. And we know, again, if we are to get around this corner, of the COVID pandemic severely affecting our communities of color, I ask uh, my communities of color, please trust the vaccine, make sure that you're getting your shot, avail yourselves of all the different ways in which you can do so, including our vaccine hunters, our county and state uh, programs that are out there, uh, and we will get through this. So thank you, Dr. Gales, appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard, Mr. President, back to you, sir. Thank you, great questions. Uh, Council Vice President Albernoz. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll start with some kudos. Um, last week, uh, towards the end of the week, I had the opportunity to visit the partnership between our vaccine hunters and Holy Cross Hospital at, uh, at a local church in one of the zip codes that has been disproportionately impacted by the virus. And it was remarkable. Uh, and I know that our public health team has very much supported their efforts. And thank you so much for that collaboration and partnerships. I, I almost got emotional. Um, because there were, it was just remarkable how well organized it was. Uh, and when you think about the backstory, it really is profound the way so many 
members of our community have stepped up to help uh, in really substantial and authentic ways over this last year. And I know many of my colleagues uh, have supported their efforts as well. And it was just a, a really important moment um, and, and it was a re really good thing to see. And also represents obviously the next phase in vaccine dissemination as we look at mobile med opportunities, as we look to dive deeper into communities that have been impacted. Um, just another example of the progress that we're making. Uh, and the other kudos I wanna give is to the public health team uh, broadly regarding the public health order we're gonna be voting on a little bit later this morning. Uh, this new framework I think makes a lot of sense. It, uh, it, it uh, allows um, organizations uh, that have done their best uh, to adhere to the guidelines, to have some more definitive goals in place, uh, which I know is something we've been wanting to provide, but now because um, our community is doing so well with the vaccine rollout, our community is doing so well by adhering to the guidelines, uh, the numbers continue to be where they are, uh, which is a credit to everyone that's worked so hard this last year. So just wanted to start with those two kudos. Um, Earlier this week, uh, Dr. Gales, we, we did receive several media inquiries uh, regarding the reports nationally that approximately 8% uh, nationally um, of residents for whatever reason are not getting their second vaccination. And Dr. Bridgers did a fantastic job uh, um, under answering that question as best he could you know, with, with the information that was before him earlier this week. I just wanted to know if you had an opportunity to um, process that a little bit. Um, I, I know the numbers, fortunately, aren't aren't as high, maybe even as 8% here locally. And Dr. Bridgers also acknowledged, to his credit and the public health team's credit, the steps we're taking in the event somebody indicates that they can't make the second vaccination, whether it be for work or scheduling challenges, and we quickly accommodate those. But if you could just uh, respond to that, because I know uh, we've received media inquiries regarding that issue. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Elvinos, for, for that question. Uh, I think it speaks to two, at least in my mind, it speaks to a couple points. I think the first one from a logistical perspective for folks who are still interested in getting their second dose and may have logistical challenges, as Dr. Bridges laid out, we will work gladly work with them uh, to make sure to facilitate them getting their second dose. Uh, we're working right now to get additional supply to make sure that we don't have any lapses in that for our residents. Um, and it's important for folks at home to understand that also, I know folks get really nervous when, you know, it, it's coming up on their 21st day or their 28th day and they get anxious if they can't make it. Fortunately, there is a window of opportunity and some wiggle room there. So I want to reassure folks at home, if you don't get it exactly on the 21st day or the 28th day, it's still okay. So it, it, you're going to be okay and we will work to facilitate and make sure that you get your appointment and get covered on that. Now, the second component of that on the flip side though is, there does appear to be some folks who are saying, you know, I got the first one, I'm not gonna come in for the second one, I've got, you know, I've got protection. To maximize the protection for your vaccine for the Pfizer and Moderna doses, you need to get both shots. So for example, receiving the first dose of Pfizer or Moderna, probably two weeks after you get that first dose, you're looking at 50 to 60% coverage in terms of protection. Now you get the second dose, two weeks after the second dose, you're looking at 95 to 96% protection. So that's a huge difference and a gap there. And so we know that particularly when looking at breakthrough cases, and when I say breakthrough cases, that's what I'm meaning by that is for folks who have received a dose of the vaccine, but have still gone on to con contract COVID. Uh, we know that even with both doses, there's an extremely small chance that you could get it, but look at that window if you've only received one shot. You've still got a 40 to 50% chance of contracting COVID because you haven't achieved ma maximum protection for that vaccine. So for anyone at home, who has said, you know, I got the first one, I'm not gonna get the second one, or I'm still in that period and thinking I may not get it, don't do that. Come in and get your second shot to maximize your protection. Because not only does that set up and protect you from COVID, it also protects your family members and others who are around you, your family members, your fellow staff members and your jobs, because you've received maximum protection to prevent potentially spreading it to others in your network. Can I add one thing to that? And I think there's a lot of people who have said, uh, you know, 
there's a lot of concerns about the second shot and some of the side effects. And, and I would say that, you, I mean, you hear a lot of, I mean, there are absolutely people who have had uh, sort of uh, feelings of malaise, tiredness, uh, some fever, you know, and, and had a bad day or two after the second shot, the first shot even for, for, for some people, but it, it is not the majority. Uh, you may, you may, when you read Twitter, you would assume it's everyone. Uh, but the reality is that I'm sure there are some who are participating in this meeting right now. Have had I know there are some who have had some, some uh, you know, some discomfort with the second shot. I know there are people who had no experience of bad feeling at all, and so it all depends on the person and things like that. And so, uh, do not. I can almost promise you that your experience with COVID would be worse than you would experience with the second shot of Pfizer, Moderna, or the first shot of Johnson and Johnson, the first and only shot of Johnson and Johnson. And I would also point out, and this is this is just a broader public health point, 92% is actually a very effective two-dose uh, vaccination effort. So I don't I don't necessarily agree with the framing of what some of the national media said, 8% being terrible. That we have to encourage people to get that second shot. There's no question about it. But 92% is not a, a overly concerning number from a two-dose vaccination effort like we're undertaking right now. We have to get that from 92 to 100. But there are other vaccination efforts that have been far worse than that in terms of the two dose regiments. So I think it's understanding where we're starting from. We have work to do, but we're not starting from a bad point of getting people to come back for that second shot. So I think it's just, uh, you know, I want to add a little context there, too. Well, you guys tag team that perfectly, just as you um, um, suggested Councilmember Rice's segment be taped. We should tape that one, too. That that was really good. Um, the final question is um, related to uh, youth. I know we've, we've been discussing this and, and not surprisingly, you know, we were all 18, 20 once uh, and felt invincible. Um, but I know there's, there's concerted, there, there is a, a strategic effort to make sure that we outreach uh, to our younger populations to ensure that they receive the vaccination. Um, I guess if, if you could just once again, underscore the importance of ensuring in particular our youth who are not immune. Uh, and then also related Dr. Gales, any updates that we've received nationally or from the state on where we are with trials for younger populations, maybe as young as 12 uh, to be able to receive the vaccination in the, in the near future. Uh, well, that, that is, yeah, definitely want to underscore, um, you know, we were all young once, um, and there is this sense of uh, invincibility that comes with youth and young adult status. Um, but what we are seeing is that uh, we are seeing an increase in cases in younger folks um, in large part. The percentage has increased because our older folks are being vaccinated, uh, but we still see cases. We see it in youth, adolescents, young adults and early, I don't, pre-mid, pre-midlife folks, I'll call the 30 to 40 year old folks pre-midlife. I just put myself in the midlife category, I guess, in that. Um, but we are, we, it, it is important for folks to get vaccinated um, because again, it's not only for your safety, it's for the safety of other people, again, in your network. And the higher percentage of folks that we can get vaccinated, the more comfortable and confident as we will as will be discussed with the, the, the resolution moving forward in terms of reopening, that we can safely do that and remove some of those restrictions and parameters in place because we know that we would be keeping community transmission down at levels as close to zero as possible. Now, some of the strategies that have gone into that, um, and this has come up before, uh, and I'll mention it here, we have continued to meet and work with our school systems around those, um, looking at op opportunities to, one, provide messaging and outreach to those areas. We met with MCPS earlier this week, actually yesterday, uh, and they are developing and working on strategies to provide outreach to parents and students related to uh, vaccines. As we work behind Behind the scenes to come up with some strategies to be able to offer vaccines to that population once it's approved for younger groups. We basically said, you know, don't wait for that to happen and wait for those logistics to be worked out before that messaging comes. So I know, I know that they will be working on that and sending out information in the near future to address that, um, as well as looking at opportunities to be able to partner uh, to create sites for uh, young people 
people to be able to get the vaccine. We anticipate, uh, for example, the clinical trials for younger people have been ongoing for months now. So that's been happening behind the scenes at a national level. Um, and I know, in fact, that we've had multiple uh, trials here in the, the, the DMV areas. I know people who have been participating in that and some of the children. Uh, and so the data is coming out. It's been in the works for several months. And again, it's encouraging that Pfizer has been able to move forward and put forth a request for a hearing for 12 to 15 while that is also happening, all of the different vaccine candidates are looking at, you know, how to how to uh, safely provide the vaccine to younger age groups. Um, and so I would encourage folks who have an interest or have children who are particularly interested in that. One of the key sites here in the DMV area is obviously National Institutes of Health. That would also be an opportunity for folks to participate in, in terms of uh, being able to, to see if they're eligible and participate in those clinical trials. Thank you very much, Dr. Gales. Um, you know, as somebody who recently learned I can no longer be classified as a young Democrat, uh, I know what you mean in terms of the midlife component. So uh, appreciate your continued leadership. Um, I yield back to you, Mr. Council President. Thank you, Council Vice President. I think we all remember when the young Democrats defined uh, their eligibility upward uh, to allow more of us to stay in as long as possible. Um, since you gave the shout out to vaccine hunters, I um, will just mention uh, I toured um, uh, the White Oak Gardens Clinic on Saturday, and it was fabulously run by HHS staff and East County Regional Center Director uh, Jay Rubande. Um, over 600 people got vaccinated. Uh, it was a terrific team effort to see Safeway providing the vaccines, the rec department providing the tents, Kingdom Fellowship and Rainbow Community Church there with emergency food relief. Uh, everyday canvassers had already gone door to door to uh, create the line of people uh, waiting to get their vaccine. It was a really beautifully effective partnership uh, once again, uh, using effective messengers. So thanks to everybody who put that together. We just need to uh, continue that. Uh, Council Member Reamer. Thank you so much. Great conversation. Appreciate everything. And it, uh, you know, we've already said in other contexts, it's so affirming to be feeling really positive in, in general uh, about where we are and where, where we're going to be soon. So uh, I wanted to start on the second dose issue. I, I really concur with Dr. Stoddard's comment there. I think it's nothing short of miraculous that 92% of the first dose population has come back for the second dose. Um, I was worried that it would be lower. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm delighted to see how high it is. You know, we'll have to keep this campaign up for a long time to ensure that we can exceed, you know, meet or exceed that level. But, um, you know, it's just fantastic to see how many people are taking this seriously and, and, and following through all the way. And, and as the comments have said, I have been concerned that the public comments about, you know, the discomfort with your second dose might lead some to think that it's almost as bad, you know, it, it, that those issues are comparable to getting COVID, you know, and of course they're not, you know, just, having the confidence that you have been fully vaccinated will change your life. And whatever discomfort you might experience from a second dose, there is actually no health concern about it. It's just a passing discomfort and it takes different forms. But I, my understanding is there's actually no actual health concern about those symptoms. Um, so whatever they might be, you know, it, it's not something that poses a risk to you personally it's it's you know more of a convenience factor um but uh, i think i believe that most people don't experience them you know i can say i was worried you know i was certainly worried i thought what am i going to do like i got to book some time and and you should book some time you might as well uh, if you can but uh it turned out to be i could just get some rest and it was okay so uh I, you know i just think it's important for us to um, try to, because there's just been a social media trend, as was said, there's been a social media trend to post about, you know, your symptoms on the, on the second shot. And um, uh, I think that's a little concerning. Um, uh, thank you for the work on students. I, I do think that's crucial for us to both campaign with the schools to reach the parents and also provide some direct vaccination clinics or, or administration of doses. 
um, in, in general, I think it's amazing how fast this is all shifting. Uh, but um, yesterday I went on to the state website to see how long it would take me to get a, an appointment uh, at, a, at a pharmacy. And Dr. Gales mentioned, you know, we need to start encouraging people more to go to their pharmacies. Uh, yesterday morning, you know, seven in the morning, I was able to get an appointment for 2.30 the same afternoon at a giant. Uh, this morning, I went back on to test it again, make sure that wasn't a fluke. I'm able to get an appointment right now for today, this afternoon, at my local giant. Um, so the number of doses at the pharmacies, you know, may be stacking up a bit, uh, which is good. You know, that's that's a great sign. But I think we, our posture has tended to be, and, and maybe our residents think that in general, it's the mass fact sites or it's the county clinics that they should be thinking about for their appo their appointments. And they should, you know, no, like we want you to pre-register. We want you to, if you haven't gotten your shot, come in when we, we send you an invitation. But uh, I don't know the number of doses. If there's a way for us to find out just to calibrate our own messaging, you know, we don't want to encourage everyone to go to their pharmacy and find out that they can't actually get an appointment uh, soon. But it does seem like there's widespread local availability potentially. And, you know, that's the, you know, over the long term, that's, that's really an important part of this. So, uh, you know, and then, of course, broadly, it makes me feel a lot better about where we're heading in terms of reopening, because getting to the point where you, you know, you can get an appointment on demand you know, pretty much same day or, or next day is an essential ingredient to any additional reopening. And I'm, you know, I'm glad that we're there. So um, I uh, wanted to ask again about the libraries, uh, rec centers, senior centers. Um, regarding the libraries, Dr. Starter, at one point you had said that there was no public health directive that was keeping them closed. I'm not sure if I understood what you meant there. Um, could you please expand on on that? And uh, anyway, could you explain what you meant there? Yeah, there was no public health order that said libraries needed to stay closed. In fact, there are some libraries that are open. It's just really more expanding the, the capacity of, of various library of libraries that are not currently open that, that needs to be done. And so my point was, I think you know, the governor's order with the senior centers, for example, senior centers can't effectively open until for the 30th of the month when the governor's order says they can open. So. Um, Right now, there is a public health prohibition around senior centers that they could not physically open be open today. That would be lifted again in several days. And so that was my point about the, uh, about the libraries. As I noted in my uh, testimony, I don't, I don't have any additional updates on the libraries. I'm, I've reached out to Director Vasallo to see you know what the status is. I know they are working through some challenges. I can't really don't know exactly where they are with, with some of those issues with, with uh, staffing particularly and um, that so yeah, I can I ask, do we know what share of the workforce has been vaccinated? I heard that at Washington Gas, only 50% of the workforce accepted a vaccination appointment, which is very concerning. Um, we, yeah, we have not been screening our uh, employees to see how many have been vaccinated, uh, largely because we have concerns about the HIPAA implications of your employer going out and looking at your medical records absent your uh permission to do so. Uh, what the county attorney is, is looking at that issue to see whether, you know, what the avenues are what reasonable. And, and, and candidly, um, we're not, because we've made offers of opportunities to those people, we're not going to change whether we open or not based on how many choose or don't choose to be vaccinated, okay. so long as they've been offered an opportunity. So that's the bottom line, is, is we're assuming that since we've offered you an appointment, you know, that... You, with the, with that's, the rare, that's our obligation. With the rare exception that you may have someone who cannot take a vaccine for a medical condition, like we'll, there will be a com reasonable accommodations for those who require them. But so long as we've had the opportunity to be offered, that's really what we're focused on. Well, I, I'm just concerned because we learned last week at the Fed committee that housing inspectors are not entering houses or housing units, I should say. You know, libraries aren't reopened. I'm very worried we might not be preparing for an adequate summer camps this summer. We didn't get adequate summer camps last summer. Um, and yet the employees have all been, at, at, you know, invited for appointments. You know, it's time for us to start providing critical public services. There are public health and other imperatives, you know, at, at play here as well. Um, so, you know, I, I hope that the executive branch can, can work through that, uh, you know, expeditiously 
we were we were sort of all expecting a library's announcement a few weeks ago, and it you know hasn't come yet. But um, in, in any event, uh, thank you to to your work. I don't know, Dr. Gales, if you wanted to add anything uh, that might have come to mind, but uh, you know, thank you for your recommendations and thank you for this new order. You know, we'll we'll talk about this new order soon, but I I'm really grateful for. Uh, what I think is a kind of a paradigm shift here. We've gotten to the point where, you know, we are, we're seeing the demonstrable success of our vaccination campaign, you know, cases plateaued, and then now they're on a downward trend. And that's really, you know, comforting. Um, and, you know, we're, we're seeing, we're making progress. So thank you. I would just say thank you, Council Member Rimmer, for sharing your experience with the vaccine as well. And I think it's important. One, I'm glad you had a podcast experience with it um, and what you stated is right we are still learning long-term effects of having a COVID infection and so when looking at you know apples to apples uh, the side effects have been temporary uh, in terms of the vaccine and I also wanted to throw out to uh, to council member Rice's point about getting the Johnson and Johnson dose I don't think I'm breaking HIPAA within this since the county executive talked about receiving the vaccine he too also received the Johnson and Johnson vaccine and has not had any of the complications that have been mentioned. The best vaccine is whichever one you can get. And, uh, you know, absolutely. And I thank Council Member Rice for his important comments there. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, um, Council President. And thank you for all sharing. Anybody that uh, has ever seen Council Member Rice jump broke should take the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I, I might take it. I don't even need it at this point. Take it to see if I can jump broke that way. But anyhow, um, my question, first off, I think we do need to be clear on the 50.4 uh, um, percent of the residents who have gotten the vaccine, that's eligible residents. That's not somebody that is just their, their general population. Is that correct? So it would be 50. That's everybody. That's the whole population, 50.4% of our whole population. It's so over 60% of our eligible. Yeah. So is that counting somebody that's 10 years old in their population? Yes, because I think the point is that, um, as we've talked about earlier in this meeting, eligibility is going to shift as we move forward. Right. And we didn't want to go forward, then go backwards and forwards and backwards because you add new eligible people, then your percentage drops if you just use the eligible population. We thought, and candidly, the virus can seemingly infect every person. Right. And so, obviously, uh, from a, from a herd immunity or, or whatever protective immunity perspective we're looking at, it's a whole population number anyway. So if we need to get 78%, we might as well just express it as such on our dashboard, which is what we've done. And so it is inclusive of everybody on the dashboard. Well, then that actually, can, and I understand what you're saying, and I appreciate what you're saying, but that actually is better than, I mean, it, we're saying that the percentage of people that could take this vaccine, whatever, whether it be Johnson & Johnson or the other two, that who could take it, our percentages are very good on, on the availability. So that's great. Um, I thought it was strictly for the eligible. And for the idea for Pfizer, that I think you said, Dr. Gales, that that, um, that it would be for 12 and up. Um, it, if we were, and, and I know that we've now started to get some Pfizer, but there were some freezer issues, I think, in the very beginning. Is, is that still a problem to get freezers for the Pfizer? Thank you for the question. There actually, one of the things that evolved over time was there were some new guidelines that were offered in terms of freezer storage that didn't require the deep freeze storage for Pfizer that it did originally. So we've been able to utilize the storage space that we have. Uh, and as point of reference, we've been receiving Pfizer for the last at least the last month or so, and we've not had any issues with storage, uh, both in terms of being able to store it on site as well as transport it and store it at the different venues. Uh, and fortunately, uh, the community partners who have also utilized Pfizer doses have not had any challenges as well. Great, that's good. And and there again, I I um, received you know my second shot, and it was Moderna. And yes, my arm hurt for a day. And I, I can tell you, I'll put up with my arm hurting a day rather than have to go to a hospital for many days. So 
it, it's it's just illogical not to put yourself through that. And I understand everybody says, well, you know, that, that you really could be go through these problems. I'm assuming that for a regular flu shot out of the millions that are given that somebody has had issues, uh, you know, eight, eight people, 10 people, whatever, have had issues over the years with a regular flu shot. But of course, this is so newsworthy that, and then of course, the newsworthiness scares people off. It, it It's just illogical to me. And I, and I encourage everyone to take it. And then the, the last thing I was going to say, well, two things. First off, when you're talking about the various places for the for the uh, to receive the vaccine, I know that that you all and HHS and everybody else has worked very hard to make certain that that churches and other religious organizations have found partners in order to to have a, a clinics in, in the uh, in that in those facilities. Are you counting that as well as are those? I mean, for instance, of CVS is a partner with, you know, a church in, in Rockville. It, are you counting those in the numbers that we're receiving as well? How, do, how does that fit in? It's being counted in terms of the, the total population vaccinated. So the way we look at it is regardless of the source of where you got it, the, the zip code where you live is pulled when we look at the number of people vaccinated. So when we say 50.4% of our population has received the first dose of the vaccine, that is including anyone from Montgomery County who's a resident who's been vaccinated at any of the different sites across the state. Now, I, and I appreciate that answer, but what I was trying to ask was when the with the with the answer for the 100,000 people or whatever that are still looking to receive it and how fast they can get it, it, it are you counting in the numbers that you're saying can be provided by the, this county um, in the state, are those numbers, or that you know what I'm asking now? Yeah. So the short answer is no. Uh, so in terms of like pl plotting out how many, how long it would take for us to get there, we only really have a firm handle in terms of how many doses we have available with the health department and uh, the mass vac site. But yes, you're right. Uh, there is a pocket of other doses there that are available. And what we try to do is in the process of sending out links to folks, uh, we do recognize, you know, we'll send multiple, you know, send a link to a person multiple times and they'll just not respond. And then we'll clean, we'll clean their name off the list, anticipating that either they most likely received a dose somewhere else, or if someone were to report to us that they've received a dose, we try to take their name from that list. Or in some cases, they're able to go through and remove their, uh, their name from the pre-registration link. And I had someone say that they had gone to, uh, I think it was a, a, gro a grocery store or a, a drug store and received their first shot, not in Montgomery County. They live in Montgomery County, but went someplace else to get it because they wanted it, which is the right thing to do. But can they get their second shot in Montgomery County from another source or do they have to go back to the same place that they got their first one? We can help facilitate getting it locally. Uh, part of the challenge is, is that the dose allocations are based upon where the first doses were done. Uh, so we're, you know, we're working around that. But if there are, you know, significant logistical issues that prevent the person from being able to do that, they should contact uh, C-19 vaccines. I'm sorry, C-19 vaccination at MontgomeryCountyMD.gov to help uh, schedule a time and the team will help facilitate that opportunity. Okay, thank you. And last one on the idea of to, to make to help our young people uh, get the vaccine, which they should be doing if they're if they're eligible to get it. I wonder if we could work with their with their partners from uh, MCPS and say that somebody that is going to be on a team that wants to, to be on, uh, you know, the various teams in, in Montgomery County Public Schools, that, that would be a requirement for them to to uh, to be to be able to be on the team is that they would get vaccination. I don't know whether that's possible or sensible or whatever, but I think that's something that might we might want to explore. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Friedson. Thank you. This has been a really great conversation, uh, one of the better ones we've had, uh, based uh, partially on the fact that we have better news. Uh, than, than we've had, which is uh, really uh, reassuring. 
I, I will say I learned a lot, including the fact that I fall into the official pre midlife category. <laughs> so I appreciate that. I'm moving towards catching up to my uh, colleagues, uh, not quite as well uh, as they have. Um, I really appreciate the conversation as well about the Twitter whataboutism, uh, you know, the uh, both with the side effects and the focus being on the negative and not on the positive. Uh, the fact that uh, you have uh, temporary, uh, fairly mild side effects uh, for a life-saving vaccine that we've been desperately waiting for. Uh, the fact that 8% is relatively low uh, for, for second doses. Uh, and, uh, you know, with, with everything that happens, it seems that the uh, immediate uh, Twitter response is a very negative one. And unfortunately, uh, those who are uh, watching see the negative. And so I think we have to do what we can uh, to drown that out as best as we can, because there is a tremendous amount of positive news. We pushed for a mass vaccination site in Montgomery County. We now have one. We have pushed for more doses. Uh, it looks like more are now coming with Johnson & Johnson uh, coming back uh, online. If you had asked uh, many of us uh, when we would get to 50% of the total population in Montgomery County uh, receiving a first dose, uh, I would not have anticipated that would be before May. And in all of our conversations uh, prior to now, uh, we have uh, moved forward ahead of schedule. Uh, and I understand it's been frustrating and it's been challenging, and this has been a really difficult time for so many of our families, uh, but uh, we are moving forward in pretty significant and, and positive uh, way. I'd also point out uh, and, and credit to the public health team, Dr. Gales, Dr. Stoddard, Dr. Bridgers, and uh, everybody who's been working so hard, not just to get the vaccine doses out, but with your guidance. And we were at 50 cases per 100,000 in extremely dangerous category, risk of the entire public or the entire health system, the healthcare system, uh, not being able to uh, handle uh, where we were only three months ago, back in late January, where we were at uh, that rate. We're now well below 10 and actually, uh, you know, currently for the last few days below nine. Uh, in the in the eight uh, per uh, 100,000, that is significant. Well below three percent test positivity rate, and consistently there, uh, and, and and below uh, where uh, you know regional counterparts and, uh, and 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 other jurisdictions for the most part around the state. So I just wanted to take a moment to note the fact, as as many of us have, that uh, it has not been easy. It it has been really uh, frustrating and challenging. Nothing about this has been perfect. Neither our response. Uh, nor the uh, ability to respond to the crisis in any way, but uh, we are uh, in uh, much better shape than many of us uh, could have imagined, and we have to keep that going. And so I just uh, really wanted to push that and note that I will echo comments made by colleagues. We've also been pushing for uh, a light uh, at the end of the tunnel for residents to incentivize the behavior that we want, including getting vaccinations and in following public health guidelines, and we now have an order based on specific metrics that are transparent and accountable and can be easily followed uh, by residents, which we've been advocating for and are now in a place uh, to do it. So I just really appreciate all the work that has gone into getting us here. I know there have been a lot of sleepless nights. Uh, there's no such thing as weekends uh, anymore. Uh, and uh, you know, someone asked me, sorry about a Sunday, and I asked what a Sunday was, and uh, the public health team has just been uh, at the forefront of this. And I just wanted to make sure that we talked about uh, all the positives because usually these conversations have been about all the things that aren't working. And I think that today we finally have turned the corner where we're mostly focused on all the things that actually are working. And that is a notable moment and that will be reflected in the uh, public health regulation that we take up shortly. And I just thought that, that needed to be uh, reiterated as many colleagues have shared uh, earlier. And I also, want to point out, in addition to the public health team, we have to thank our residents, the businesses and organizations and families who have made unthinkable sacrifices, have totally changed their behavior, have made incalculable uh, changes to their lives and livelihoods in order to keep themselves, their families, and our neighbors safe. And uh, it's working. And we have to keep moving forward on it. Uh, I did just have a couple specific Questions. Many of my uh, questions were already asked. I just wanted to get clarification on the Johnson and Johnson doses. Uh, we had we had 1,300 doses that were held uh, based on the state order following the CDC 
uh, review out of an abundance of caution. Is, is that the number that I heard earlier? I think Dr. Stoddard had mentioned that. But for instance, the mass vaccination site, there are several hundred at, at the local uh, Department of Health. I think Dr. Dales has that number. There are 1,300 for the mass vaccination site at Holy Cross, uh, Germantown, that can be used at the mass vac site. There are some number of hundreds that are left at the public health that will be used for our homebound residents and uh, other groups that are targeted with those. Yes, we have, I believe, 284 doses yesterday uh, on site at Dennis Avenue. Great. Okay. So based on where we currently are, we don't know how many new Johnson & Johnson doses we're going to get of the millions that are being shipped out. We're waiting to hear. We've told the state, you know, we're ready. Send, send them to us as quickly as you can. We'll administer them as fast uh, as we uh, receive them and can get uh, 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 folks uh, for their appointments. Uh, and we're allowed to, based on the current guidance, you are able to administer the ones that we have currently that were held, held over now or we're waiting for the state on that. Uh, we're allowed to administer now. There currently aren't any restrictions on uh, distribution of those or any contraindications. Um, so we will continue to use those. Um, we've been prioritizing those to get through that homebound list that we talked about earlier. Now, if the state does release any um, specific guidelines to change that, we will obviously implement those. But at this current time, there aren't any restrictions on usage. Terrific. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. That's what I thought, but I wanted to make sure I understood that. Uh, that's good news. I hope that we do get more. I will note, as has been stated, uh, the place where there's a large backup is the local health department in Montgomery County, uh, where we have folks who want to receive access who haven't been able to. And so hopefully, as additional doses uh, are uh, received by the state, that a, a large share of them come to Montgomery County so that we can get shots in arms uh, as quickly as possible. Um, I, I will note the 8% and, and, and folks that aren't re returning as things get closer uh, to folks, it will be better because some of it, in the, uh, the hesitancy is based on practicality, not philosophy. And so if you are a parent who has to look after children during the day, if you are a worker who can't afford to take off of work for a day or uh, two days, certainly can't go a long distance uh, to do it. So as we make it easier, I think that the uh, the, the percentage of those who uh, may not show up for a second dose will diminish as well because it'll be more convenient and less of a disruption in people's lives uh, in order to get the first and the second dose. So hopefully uh, that will help uh, as well. If it's possible at some point, if we have our own either Montgomery County or state number for the 8%, is that something that can be shared? The 8% is a national number. Uh, but if, if it's possible uh, at, at some point, I'm sure it's something that the, the state health department and the county health department are keeping an eye on and monitoring. But if that's something that could be shared, um, you know, that would be helpful. My my guess, and I don't know, you know I'm certainly not an expert, is that our number is going to be lower um, based on the level of demand that we have uh, in the county. And so uh, that will be positive news as well. But it's obviously become a major topic of conversation in the public. So I, hopefully we could dispel some of it. Um, okay. Um, in terms, of, there was a conversation before about the total population. That's what we're basing this order off of. I understand the rationale uh, b behind that uh, with eligibility changing and the fact that uh, even though our progress should be judged by percentage eligible, the virus is not uh, making determinations based on eligibility. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, 15 versus 16 is not something that a virus is uh, determining, just like it doesn't respect borders. Um, but do we have a percentage of um, how much of the population is not eligible? You know, is it 21%, 22%, 23%? Do we know that that number? Population, we know that 17 and younger is about 18%. So obviously, if you take the 17 year olds out of that who are eligible, it's probably in the area of maybe you know, 17, 16 or 17%, that's my guess. Is our best estimate. Okay, that would be helpful. So, so 100% in terms of the total population uh, receiving a first dose is really 77% based on, uh, you know, based on, we can't get above 77% based on the eligibility today, right? We're at 50%, but we can't get to 100% because 17% of the population is not even able to get a vaccine. Or the other 80, 83. 
you know, could. Yeah, so I think we, I mean, if we got everyone vaccinated, we could get 80, we could get up to 80, 83% of everyone. Okay, well, I think that we should note that. I think there's a lot of confusion around uh, what this means. There is the, <clears throat> the vaccination dashboard, which I think is terrific, particularly as we introduce this new portal. I think making that very clear of the percentage of the, you know, p p population, you know, uh, that, that isn't eligible. Um, there's also uh, two major charts uh, on that uh, website. The first one is the 50.4% that we just hit yesterday uh, for uh, those who've received uh, at least a first dose. And then uh, the, the second one to that to the right is the 33.6 that have been fully vaccinated. Based on that chart, is that fully vaccinated as in two weeks following a shot or is that fully vaccinated as in received a first dose of Johnson & Johnson or the second of a two dose vaccine? The chart is just both doses. So it really needs to be framed as both doses as opposed to fully vaccinated because as you noted, fully vaccinated does include the two week period post second dose or post Johnson & Johnson at which point you're fully immune. So. Uh, we can clarify that element on the page because you're correct. In, in our met, in, in CDC's definition of fully vaccinated, you do need that, need that post second dose uh, time to develop immunity. Okay, so I, I, by the time, like by the end of the day today, that really the language really needs to be changed on that dashboard so folks can follow based on the order. And so I'd hope that we can get uh, that clarified. And just so folks understand. For the first two phases of the order, the the dashboard, the total percentage population is is the number. We're at fifty percent now. That will be triggered when we hit sixty. When that hits sixty percent, the second phase will be triggered. For the third phase of total uh, uh, population fully vaccinated, the chart on the right that we currently have, when that hits fifty, two weeks following the day that that hits fifty is when it will go into effect. Is that accurate? Based on the order, right. that, that uh, public health regulations. Yes. Okay, great. So if you could, if we could get that uh, cleaned up and uh, the language clarified, that would be uh, great. Uh, I will just uh, end where I started. Uh, besides my pre midlife uh, 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 recognition, uh, and just thank you for all the hard work. I, I really do feel much better about the place that we are at as a county and. Uh, it's a credit to the public health team and to our residents, businesses, and organizations who have stepped up to follow guidance and are following through with what we're asking them to do, including getting vaccinated in large numbers and appreciate all, all of the efforts to get here. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Glass. Thank you very much, Mr. President. A very good conversation this morning. I appreciate all of the updates and, and most of the questions that I had asked uh, or were planning on asked had been had been asked by my colleagues. So, so I'll keep this uh, pretty short. Uh, um, the only question I have is, is regarding our facilities. And this has come up by, by a few of my colleagues. Um, you know, I, I think it's important for us to share with our residents some of the complexities with opening up facilities that uh, are serving double duty as uh, testing and vaccination sites and some other things. And so, um, you know, Dr. Gales and Stoddard if, if, um, and Dr. Bridges, of course, uh, if, if you can go a, a little more um, in, and explain um, kind of the, the internal deliberations that are taking place uh, about uh, where to expand uh, services, uh, whether they are senior services, recreation services, that sort of thing, uh, and, and uh, justify that or compare that to uh, the, the health needs that we're trying to serve as well. Thank you, Council Member Glass, for the question. Uh, Dr. Bridgers has been our representative in a number of those conversations with the senior centers, which also influences our rec centers. Um, so I would uh, open the floor to him. He can give a brief summary about some of those conversations and insights. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Council Member Glass. So we've had conversations with our senior citizens, uh, access, um, availability, time, space, and I'm just trying to draw from recall here is I don't have my notes in front of me, but we have daily planning conversations with our aging and disability services to look at some of those facilities. Um, just uh, just, uh, just a, a quick note. And that's pretty much, um, I can provide you with a written summary. Uh, I just don't have the information before me. 
No, I, I, I appreciate that. And and even just um, more generally. Dr. Riley said something this, and I think it's a really important thing for us to remind the public of that. And I know you know all this, but we have, we have recreation buildings and staff working in vaccination testing. We've expanded into two recreation centers, our homeless population to spread them out so they're not as compressed and, and you know, at risk for a, transmission they're working those the recreation staff are working those library staff as well um, and so i know that i think uh may 8th is the date where we're extricating all of the recreation staff from the hhs testing and vaccination efforts and backfilling those with contract support staff so those rec staff can begin to do some of those other activities um now th that that's sort of the the staffing piece of it but then as you know you know as we talked about some of those i think uh one of the rec centers is being used for um, two are being used for vaccination sites. One currently is being utilized for that homeless shelter piece. And so obviously, you know, the buildings and the staff are just critically important to the efforts. We realize getting these senior centers and libraries open is critical as well. So we're in the process of shifting all of those people out and getting those buildings cleared, cleaned, and ready to operate as their original intention. But obviously some of that just takes a little bit of time to do, and you don't want to, uh, cause delays in the vaccination testing or other efforts while you're simultaneously planning to open these other things up. And so we're trying to do both those things correctly. Um, and um, I, I promise we're gonna have updates on all these uh, very soon. I'll continue to push those as well. But I think I think your 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 want to illustrate that those 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 staff and buildings have served, been serving those dual roles to help our community is very important. And so just to add a couple of things also come to mind. We also look at um, uh, site uh, con configuration. We have a site survey team. We work with uh, Dr. Stoddard's team to go out and not only look at ease of throughput, but accessibility to make sure that all of those spaces are ADA compliant. We have wheelchair accessible uh, individuals readily available to support those individuals who may have some ambulatory challenges in getting to their sites. We have uh, particular um, um, uh, check-in uh, stations, if you will, so that they don't have to stand in line. There's a there's a particular space, a desk that they will uh, go to. And we have staff available uh, to them, so we want to make it as easier as easy as possible, and easier for those individuals that may have some mobility challenges. Again, uh, we have staggered them throughout the day. Sometimes we go into facilities and identify spaces where we know that they're early risers or we know that individuals just to not to disrupt their daily schedule and or um, um, personal or family routines and to provide individuals the accessibility to have um, vaccine planning strategies around before, during and after those spaces. So those are some of the additional things that come to mind. Again, I can provide a more comprehensive narrative as Dr. Stoddard said, but in listening to Dr. Stoddard, a couple of things did come to surface. Uh, and and uh, I really appreciate that explanation as, as my colleagues and I are all getting requests and questions from people who've been vaccinated for weeks and some even for months, that they are ready to get outside of their homes, they're ready to socialize, they're ready to, to start participating in activities, and, and uh, we're not quite there yet. And the quite frank reason is because we have staff and facilities committed to keeping everybody healthy and trying to get our vaccines out there. And so... Uh, sharing sharing that insight, I think, is is important, and we've just had that conversation, so uh, more people will be aware of the complicating factors. Uh, but we're getting there. And Dr. Bridges, thank you for for the preparation uh, and the groundwork that you're doing, so that we can all see each other again, and seniors and youth can go back to our rec centers uh, and other facilities. So uh, thank you. This is all very encouraging news, and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Councilmember Dewan. Thank you. Uh, bringing up the rear here. And uh, I, Dr. Gales, you know, I, I still feel young. So I'm just going to say that, you know, I hope I hope we all do. Um, uh, but really happy to that we're here with some good news. Thank you, as always, to all the work that you and your teams uh, Dr. Bridges, Dr. Stoddard, and everyone that's behind the screen here that's been working furiously. Um, I think this is a testament to the approach we've taken, you know, and I think that, you know, that bears saying, you know, we're happy that we're moving in the right direction. 
And I think the reason we've consistently been lower than everyone else in the state, I think you said 24 out of 24 today, uh, uh, counties, Dr. Gales, is because we've taken precautions and we've been uh, methodical. We haven't been able to do everything we want. You know, we still have disparities in the vaccination process. We tried, we've taken steps with our equity framework. We've tried to take others that we were not able to move forward, but we're, we're finding workarounds and we're being nimble, uh, but sticking true to, uh, you know, a cautious approach. And that's why we're able to take the action we're going to take uh, in a few minutes here um, and start to reopen and expand capacity. Uh, so it's, it's a really a great testament to, I think, collectively, it wasn't always pretty. It wasn't always easy. We didn't always agree, but, and we're not out of the woods, but we're making uh, significant progress. So I just wanted to to say that, that the two are connected. I think some people, some people will say after today's action about time, you should have done it five weeks ago. Others will say like, which I think is the correct approach is we'll say, thank you for being methodical. Glad we have 50% of our population vaccinated and glad we're still moving forward. So uh, that's, that's what I think. Uh, and that the data has borne out has happened. So I just want to commend my colleagues, the health department and all of our partners in the community who have helped make this happen. Uh, just a couple of very specific questions because many have been, most have been answered. Just on the variants themselves, uh, do we have any report on has, what's the dominant strain? Do we have any news on that? Have things taken over? Do you still have any concern there? Just how that's, how that's going. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Jawanda. Uh, the the B one one seven or the UK strain continues to be the dominant strain in Maryland, um, and based upon the reports, again, not every strain is getting uh, sequenced to know, but I would suspect that uh, the higher higher percentage of our new cases are the B one one seven variant, consistent with the rest of the state. And it's still, but but thankfully. We didn't know it this at first. It seems to be just as the, the vaccines just seem to be just as effective against it or, or mostly effective. You're not seeing. So, yeah, so the, the early data suggests the vaccines are uh, effective against uh, particularly the B117, the UK variant, the P variant, uh, the P1 variant or the Brazilian form and the South African form. And in addition to that, to be perfectly candid, I think one thing that has been helpful for us is that, again, we have had tighter restrictions in place to minimize points of contact that would create the type of environment that would allow for the variant strains to flourish and spread more quickly. I appreciate it. Perfect point. Um, I know we've had some, you know, as we continue to go back to school and, you know, uh, Tuesday mornings have become my favorite morning, not just for council session, but it's because the day all of my children are out of the house in school, um, you know, all four of them. And that, that's it's it's uh has it it's been a couple of weeks it's still kind of odd, um, but for those who are still dealing with that I know we've had some cases, um, just if you could give an update on how we're doing uh, as we re-enter school and uh, as far as either vaccinations or case rates and and, and anything you want to add on that point. Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to follow up with you with the more specific, you sure. know, with the hard numbers, but we have had uh, some instances of um, of community transmission presenting in terms of staff and students testing positive. Um, we haven't seen as many uh, student to student or staff to student transmission. We have had a couple episodes of that, but it has not been significantly um, significantly higher. Again, I think in large part because we uh, worked hard to get the staff members vaccinated, prevent, you know, them from bringing it into the classroom uh, to potentially transmit to other staff and students. Uh, we have had, we've continued to have some concerns related to youth sports activities. Um, as we, sh we shared with you all last week, we did have a situation where um, we have had a large outbreak of cases related to a hockey tournament um, and hockey teams. So we continue to be concerned about that and in terms of the types of activities that the young people are participating in. But fortunately, we haven't seen a large scale number of outbreaks. There have been smaller cases um, in more isolated.
isolated situations. And to clarify that, because to your earlier point, I think one would rush and say, well, that's the justification where we should have had, you know, schools in session for a longer period of time. What's very different now than where we were in August of last year, or pretty much through most of the pandemic, is we have vaccines, yeah. And we have, uh, as with the push to get the teachers and staff for public and non-public schools covered, uh, we've seen that number drop down. And I think in large part due to the vaccine status of the staff and teachers involved. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, and, and the specific data as follow-up would be great. Another question I had, and you can speak to it briefly now, is my last question. On the, you know, we're, we're going to, we're implementing a number of strategies to address the disparities in vaccination. Um, we still have those red zones. Uh, you know, uh, there's actually one red zone that's really dark red on the 65 plus in the kind of upper east county. I, I, I would love to know exactly where that is. It was, the, it was really dark red. Uh, in the Upper East County, and that was on the 65 plus, where most of the numbers have been going in the right direction. But still on the 16 to 64, we still have a significant work to do. Are you tracking, uh, you had one slide that showed uh, where people are getting their vaccinations. If they go in the state of Maryland, it's up to, up, updated in the system. We know where they went and they got their vaccination, correct? Is that Yes. Okay. I see you nodding. And I know Dr. Stoddard has talked about this too. If they go out of state, we don't know if they've been vaccinated or not. If they go to DC or Virginia, Northern Virginia, we wouldn't have that access to that, correct? We would not, but actually there is a CDC dashboard uh, that uh, we have found that seems to be tracking fully full vaccination, not first dose vaccinated, but full vaccination uh, anywhere you receive it. And so we're actually trying to track that because I, I don't want to put forward data that I can't explain. And so we are looking at what the genesis of that dashboard is. But what the dashboard essentially said is, as of yesterday, we were at 37.5% population fully vaccinated. And so that means that roughly 4% of our population has been fully vaccinated that we don't know about because they've been vaccinated in other places. But again, that's what this, the, it is on the CDC dashboard. I looked at it yesterday, but we have right. to be able to, I want to be able to justify what's on that dashboard with some explainer to tell where it's coming from. But the but the point is we may be farther along than we even realize because there are a fair number of vaccinations occurring outside the state of Maryland. For yeah, that, that was going to be my question. I, I, I know a lot of people, I know 10 people just that have went to Howard or gone to, you know, gone to places in DC or that got vaccinated that we probably don't have access to, but it is a knowable number. So I'm glad you're tracking that down because of the process of vaccination. We, we should be able to know that. And I think in particular to our black and Latino community, um, we should know this for everybody, but I would want to know, you know, for going forward, not just for to get where we need to get now, but going forward, where are people accessing the vaccine as a, a kind of an equity framework of where did where are they where did they go and how did they get there so that we can try to track backwards and figure out not only for the ones we still need to get vaccinated, but also just for our our work in public health and in delivery of services going forward, where are people accessing things. And I just think that will be something to, don't expect you to answer it today, but I, I, I think we should be looking into that for as we go along. So, all right. Thank you, Ms. President. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I don't see any, are there any other colleagues that want to chime in? Yeah, I'll have text with you. Oh, okay. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, well, not much to add, obviously, because it's been very robust conversation. I think this is a very important date um, because we are uh, really here uh, acknowledging a very important milestone. Uh, and it is important to recognize that uh, as, it, as it has been said, we would not be here without the cooperation of our residents and without their full um, understanding of why we had to make certain decisions. Uh, listening to what they had to say, but also responding to make sure that we'd we would address many of the inequities. So it is a very um, important day, but as we've also said, uh, we still have quite some you know, ways to go. Um, I, in my household, got two uh, daughters in their 20s, and uh, one will get her second shot tomorrow, and the younger one will get her second shot next week, and I'll be there to uh, cheer them on. Um, but as, as it was also um, stated earlier, 
you know, it is true that uh, with second shots, people have different reactions to that. And I think the good news is that we know that it has been safe. Uh, in my household, my husband had no symptoms. I had a headache and some joint pain for 48 hours and like clockwork, it was gone. Uh, but the reality is that this is such a critical and important, um, you know, asset for us, this issue of access to vaccinations. It's, it's so critical. And that is what is contributing to what we are going to do next which is something our residents have been wondering for a while. So I am really proud of Montgomery County residents. When we look at what's happening in other jurisdictions, you know, this has not been easy, but this particular milestone has been super, super important. And this team, I think, deserves a lot of credit as it also, I think we need to recognize all of our community partners um, throughout this county that have done such amazing work and continue to do amazing work to get us there. So you know, congrats, because I think we need to acknowledge that, but also with caution continuing to wear our masks and social distancing when necessary. Um, but most of all, please pre-register and please make sure to get this important vaccine. It is so important and so critical. Um, and I know a lot of folks are also looking forward to the summer. So it's, it's, it's all together, right? It's, it's all part of what we all need to do. Um, but, you know, really important briefing and, uh, again, very important uh, item that we're going to take up next. Um, so just in general, just to say, you know, kudos and, and keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, thanks to all of you for uh, the briefing. Very, very helpful uh, discussion and for all your hard work on the proposed regulation we're about to take up.